you know, many, many different suggestions came up today on how lawyers can tackle the task um, of taking these cases that have already been decided and moving forward, either to strengthen the thinking and the decision making that was made, but also to tackle new issues and new areas and gaps that are coming up. Um, you know, we, we heard that lawyers have many daunting jobs, actually. We have to stop big boulders from falling down mountains. We have to keep ships from sinking. Um, and while the law alone is not enough to do these things, it clearly does play a critical role in at least stopping things from getting worse, at a minimum, and I would argue at least in helping move things forward to get better. Um, the panelists here are really uh, represent so many different perspectives that I think have come up today in terms of the kinds of partnerships that lawyers really need in order to take cases to the next level. Lawyers alone cannot make social change happen. That's just a reality. Um, and we need all of you here um, and your colleagues as well to, to join us in this fight. And hopefully, you know, we'll start that conversation here. So, you know, we have panelists from law schools, um, we have um, from health public health organizations. We have panelists that have engaged in judicial capacity building, have worked in courts beyond just the high courts and Supreme Court, um, and also with, that are within civil society movements. Um, so I am really thrilled to welcome this panel. So um, our first panelist um, is going to be Ms. Mehta Gandhi, who is the Director of Policy at IPAS Development Foundation. She joined IDF in 2012 to lead the policy initiative and manage active engagement with government officials on focusing to advocate for increasing access to safe abortion. She also leads a portfolio for engaging with partner organizations to advocate for comprehensive abortion care integration into the larger maternal health care agenda. She's worked in maternal health for over a decade, um, and her experience ranges from implementing large-scale programs at community levels to policy advocacy for improving maternal health nationwide. She's previously worked with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Care India, and SEDPA. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in social work. So with all of those perspectives, I welcome your a few, just five minutes or so of thoughts on how the role, I guess, of, of um, policy and public health organizations in um, taking forward these cases. Or th Up to you. So I'm going to um, talk a little about the role that um, agencies play. And while I say that, um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer saying that while most of you are lawyers here, I'm not a lawyer. And uh, I've been working a lot on uh, access to comprehensive abortion care, and I am not a doctor. So I fit somewhere in between there, trying to talk about uh, women's issues uh, when they are in the process of accessing comprehensive abortion care. Um, I work for an organization called IPAS Development Foundation. Um, IDF works uh, with a singular mission of increasing access to um, women's access to comprehensive abortion care, which also includes comprehensive contraceptive care. And uh, in light of that, when um, I think of role of agencies in um, abortion service provision, we have to look at it in two dimensions, that there, um, who is the largest service provider for abortion service delivery in India? And if you're looking at um, our population spread, most of our women are in rural, extremely underserved areas where the only provision of safe abortion services is the public sector. So the role that agencies need to play is to strengthen the public health system. Yes, there is a whole dimension of accountability, of questioning what is happening, what is not happening, but the reality is that if there's going to be any services, if women are going to get access to safe abortion services, at the current point in time, it can only be through the public health system. And there are huge gaps there. So that is an area that we definitely need to strengthen. And there are a whole lot of opportunities that need to be maximized to be able to take that. The MTP Act, which currently governs uh, abortion in India, and it is considered to be one of the most liberal abortion laws, is what we need to take forward. Are all the provisions of the MTP Act currently being implemented to the best of its ability? As I was hearing in the previous panel also, we always talk about a great law, framework we have it there we have we have the we have the permissions but is it being implemented effectively 
you know, there was there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago, 2010 maybe, which said that, which did a data analysis and brought out that about 68,000 women have access to maybe one train provider. So those are the kind of challenges that we need to deal with. And again, in another dimension, when we're talking about access, the other aspect, the other group that we need to look at is doctors. They're constantly questioned as to, are they providing the right services? Are they looking at it from a rights framework? We need to understand that doctors also live in the same social framework as do lawyers, as do judges, as one of you asked that question that, is it a court responding or is it a judge responding? See, we are living in the same society. So abortion comes with an additional caveat of, of stigma, of, you know, people getting to know that yes, you had sex, whether it's, and if you're, if you're a young person, oh my God, if you're not married. You know, that whole conversation that you were having about uh, child marriage, it's really about legalizing sex, right? We're talking, why are young people getting forced to marry really early? And why is there this whole need to regulate their sexual behavior and their ability to have an abortion? Because we want to decide who's going to have sex when. And we're a very conservative society, but we're very willing to talk about this. And within this, we expect doctors to be extremely liberal. We expect the government to be extremely liberal. So there are so many of these dimensions that we need to look at. So I think somewhere as a group of lawyers and doctors and agencies, we need to see how we create an enabling environment that does not intimidate girls and women thinking that for every abortion you need to go to the court. There are systems in place where they can go and get services. So that's where I wanted, those are the points that I wanted to raise. Mm -hmm. And if you give me a minute, I can talk about the conflict of laws, but if you say- One no. minute, yeah, go ahead. And ahead. within that framework, so while I say that the MTP Act, yes, it doesn't allow um, access from a rights perspective, but it does allow access. Right? And there are very, very broad conditions. But where does the confusion come in? When there isn't clear understanding of what MTP Act allows. And within that, that there isn't really a conflict with the PCP and DT Act. There isn't really a conflict with the POCSO. The, the dimensions are very different. MTP Act assures confidentiality. POCSO requires reporting to prevent further abuse of a young person. But if we want to look at it from a different perspective, then there is a problem. I often hear doctors in the public sector also saying that the Havaldar comes and takes a round in the antenatal area to find girls who've come for an abortion thinking, Isse to paise banenge. is that a law problem? That is not a law problem. That is an implementation problem. So then is, are we right to say that the laws are at conflict? And I guess I'm going to leave that for you to answer because I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Malvika Rajkotia, who is a leading family law lawyer in the country. She's worked with various NGOs on civil liberties and human rights issues. Her upcoming book, Intimacy Undone, is due to be released in the last week of February, very soon. Yeah, it was out today, actually. <laughs> oh, now. congratulations. Oh, um, and in this book, she examines complexities of marital relations and disruptions in India and provides an insightful view of the practice of family law through a gendered lens. Right, so the topic, as far as I'm concerned, is very broad and general. I'm not a specialist as, you know, the, the very, uh, the, the, packed with information conversations that I've heard earlier. So I'm afraid I don't have that much data on this particular aspect. But the but what I can pick up from what was said earlier and what, uh, what Medha said is that um, you cannot expect judges to, that's exactly the point, to be very different or any different from the social milieu that they are a part of number one. Number two, patriarchy and its oppression is not limited to just some class which is outside English speaking and broad left liberal rooms. You'll be surprised as to how oppressive patriarchy is amongst the richest amongst the, the best educated. It's got nothing to do with education either. And sometimes the finest education is used to, to uh, persuade and use to, to dilute and take away the edge of patriarchy by making it benevolent patronage. 
but under no circumstance is there any discussion about dismantling it. And in those circumstances, as a divorce lawyer, the, the, in the few minutes that I have, the, the, the case that I will quickly tell you about will evoke the necessary image which is necessary for the, con uh, for the conversation. A couple, I'm, I'm representing the wife, they're both highly educated, upper Indian, uh, you know, very much in the rich upper 10% class, say, of India business and so on and so forth. Foreign educated, if you think that it's got not, not they're not just some BA uh, in some middle, you know, foreign educated, etc. maybe MIT in software and that type of thing. With that background, very fashionably dressed, etc. The precondition of the marriage, it was an arranged marriage, was there should be four children. Now I can understand there is that aspect in an arranged marriage which is contractual. So perhaps she said, well, of the baby, if there was no surgery. But if there was invasive surgery to remove a major gland, then it was safe to have the child. She was hesitant, but was went into family counselling and marriage counselling and came to the decision that yes, okay, amongst a larger things, it's a small, small price, it's her gland, but anyway, she's given it up. The moment that happened and she got pregnant is the husband stopped attending the marriage counselling sessions. She, then the marriage fell apart soon after that and now that we are discussing divorce and he's discussing wanting her back because he's missing the child, I said, look, you better think again because I do know that you had said you'd wanted four of them and I can tell you for sure there's not another one happening. So might be better if you actually exit this marriage properly and negotiate your fresh three babies, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> then, four, no? then, then there will be full four. But what I'm talking about is that there was this woman there was this highly educated man who was not embarrassed or defensive in discussing this with me because he did not think there was, that is the point, he did not think that he was saying anything unusual, number one. He did not think that this illiberality is, is tribalistic, is primitive, is something he should hush up if he has it inside him. He should be attending counselling to get rid of it. He did not think that. That's the dangerous part. And as for this woman, she was... It's a clear indicator of the privileged sections of society having no agency over their bodies. And we talk of marital rape, rape that's the obvious end of the argument in any case, that there is no agency. <clears throat> reproductive health, when we talk about the image that it evokes is of reproducing, as if that we are going to reproduce, but it is subject to certain rights. But reproductive health also, rights of reproduction also ha have to include the right not to reproduce. And that needs to be part of the discussion. Now, I understand in extreme cases of the sort of the emergency situations that are there, this is all that takes up the time of uh, the systems. But that needs to be discussed as well as a backroom parlay to feed and change attitudes in what's happening even in the emergency situation. So perhaps when that conversation is happening, emergency situations may reduce. Seems like a long shot at the moment, but by and large, that's what, uh, that's what. Now, judges, when we talk, what can lawyers do? There are very few lawyers actually like the lawyer, like, like you, like the lawyers that like us, you, you know, most of, most of, uh, we all, I personally have experience of meeting more lawyers not like me who will have all the problems that you are talking about a Havaldar having, but a LLB graduate, masters, PhD and so on and so forth we may very well have precisely the issues that you have raised and thought that it will be for a lesser educated, maybe at a lower base cop level, you know, it'll be a problem of that kind of primitive thinking. That's not so. Patriarchy abounds in its most primitive perspectives. It's only that sophistication, it has be achieved sophisticated disguises. And we have to learn to get through them. That's, yeah, I'm done. Okay. Very 
Um, so the next speaker is Ms. Stella Paul, who is a multimedia journalist reporting independently on environment and development issues, such as climate change, sex trafficking, gender violence, and sustainable development. She's currently based in Hyderabad um, and reports for several leading media outlets. She also trains women from the most vulnerable communities in internet, video, and social media, and has won several awards for her journalism. Um, that include the National Media Award India in 2013, the DART Center Fellowship in 2013, UN Media Award for Best Gender Sensitive Reporting in 2012, and the UN Convention to Combat Des Desertification Fellowship in 2012. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, everyone. It's... Nobody had tea and nobody's sleeping, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, I would follow um, Malavika, and I would begin with uh, from what I learned, what I heard throughout the day. And um, one of the thing was, um, of course, it also keeps keeping with the theme of how do we move forward. So let me first begin with that, uh, coming from the media. By the way, I report for the international media, but I do cover uh, hyper-local stories across South uh, Asia Pacific, and a lot of that is in India. And 99% of my uh, stories are on the marginalized people. Um, so um, one thing that I have noticed is that it's not, uh, I, I mean, um, abortion rights, uh, of course, reproductive rights in general, but specifically uh, abortion rights is a terribly underreported uh, issue, and not just in India, but across our region. Um, and uh, it is so easy to take a dig at the media for ignoring this and ignoring that, but let me tell you that a big, big reason is here is the lack of capacity. And uh, a lot of journalists would love to cover these underreported stories, but because uh, you, we have heard Edwards uh, earlier, we have heard several other uh, you know, speakers here, and we realized that this topic, this the reproductive rights, is a multidimensional, a very, very complicated issue. It is not an unidimensional issue where you just go and say, Sarkarne, yene, kia, wone, kia. you know, that kind of thing. You have to get the legal facts right, you have to get the medical facts right, you have to hear the community. Um, so the best thing I would suggest is whenever we are having a dialogue like this and we have a wonderful platform like this, can we also create a special space there for specifically interacting with the journalist? And there, because we have a room full of wonderful issue experts, can we have somebody brief the journalist on a particular uh, case, legal case? It could be it could be a, a field case like the Vika Viswas that was mentioning earlier, or a certain uh, maybe a, a, a development in court, and help the journalist understand how this particular issue could be covered from multiple angle, security angle, if this is coming from a, a, a conflict zone, uh, from the from economy business angle, from health angle, from technology angle, and then you would see that the stories are just coming out just like that, because it is extremely difficult for a journalist covering a non-health issues to, or non-reproductive issues to just delve into the topic and, and you know report it. So that thing, I think that's what started right in the beginning by saying the societal norms have to change. And uh, Colleen said that he doesn't believe in, we have all, everything barbaric, the, the lawmakers are barbaric, the lawyers' courts are barbaric. We have, we still need to bring in social change. Pyle said that it can't, lawyers can't do this alone. Well, media can't do this alone either. And nobody, everybody has, I'm, I don't know if I should be feeling honored by this. I actually don't that media has been kind of exempted from <laughs> these societal norms. But believe me, media is so driven by the societal norms. For example, I attend event after event after event, and all I see are female journalists being, you know, in the room. I don't see male journalists coming and attending 
uh, uh, events on reproductive rights. Now, I don't know, I mean, whether they were not invited, Politics is or I don't know if the editor assigned them, but I do know that there are great editors who write great op-eds in support of reproductive rights and sexual rights of women. And these are the same editors who then assign a female journalist to go and cover this. Yes, I'll be done. So that's, that's a great area where you know the news media can definitely go and break a, a rule. And the second thing is budgeting, that there is almost, I believe that um, uh, there is next to nil budget when it comes to uh, uh, the covering this issue. I would just take one ex uh, 30 seconds extra to tell a story. So my, uh, my, my uh, experience of covering reproductive rights began in 2013. I was in Chhattisgarh, I was in Dantewada, and I was going through all the Dantewada, Sukma, and all those Maoist affected districts. And I met a, a government officer there, and he said, uh -huh, Madam Ji, kahan se aye? So I cover, you know, I write for an uh, US uh, organization, so I said, huh, uh, you know. And he said, Acha, New York se aye ho. Itne achhe kapde pehne ho aur kya abortion chi 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 chi. Aisa kyu? Aapko koi dhanka topic nahi mila kya? Aap Raipur aiye, aapko bahut sare topic dila dete madam. Yaha jungle mein kya kar rahe ho? So, <laughs> so that kinds of sums up, you know, like of course it didn't push me back, it pushed me forward. But that, I would say that that's one thing that we journalists keep, that wall we keep facing again and again. And I think there's only one way forward to break it and go. Thank you. Um, so our next panelist is Professor Dr. M.P. Singh, who is currently the Chancellor of the Central University of Haryana and Chair Professor of the Center for Comparative Law, NLU Delhi. He was until recently visiting the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law um, in Heidelberg. Before that, he was the chairperson of the Delhi Judicial Academy, New Delhi, and he was also the vice chancellor of the National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. He has delivered prestigious endowment and other lectures at several universities and academic institutions in India and abroad. His publications include over 100 papers in national and international legal journals and edited works and 10 books. Comparative public law, including especially constitutional law, administrative law, human rights and legal systems, are his major interests. So we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Thank you so much for this detailed introduction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, today, of course, uh, apart from learning a new aspect of uh, law and uh, also life experiences. Uh, the main reason is because Deepika asked me to come. And uh, I never want to disappoint my former students wherever they are. So uh, today I had two uh, this kind of programs. In the morning I was in the law faculty. That's why I was a little late. I missed to hear Justice Sikri. Uh, but uh, uh, I came because she asked me to come. Uh, I asked her uh, again and again that uh, maybe I won't be able to make any contribution uh, uh, in respect of this issue. I read, uh, of course, uh, uh, reports in the newspapers. Sometimes I look into interesting cases also. I know about uh, our rights under Article 21 and uh, 14. 15, all those uh, issues that uh, concern women and uh, uh, sex discrimination, all those things. But uh, this issue I have uh, never uh, actually uh, uh, learned as a expert or uh, specialist in that area. But uh, she showed me the way by telling that at least you can tell uh, what happens in the uh, judicial academies. Uh, now, so far as judicial academies are concerned, uh, I was there for two years. I remember that uh, in uh, uh, every year uh, a list of uh, subjects or topics which uh, have to be discussed with the judges is drawn. And in one of those two years, in one year, of course, uh, this uh, MTP was there. but. Uh, uh, perhaps only for one session. It's not that it was uh, very thoroughly uh, discussed. Uh, I asked the current uh, um, chairperson, uh, and he said that uh, High Court has given some instruction 
that uh, not the N uh, MT uh, uh, MTP Act, but the other act, this uh, preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques uh, act, uh, 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 that must be definitely discussed and taught as one of the uh, topics uh, uh, in the academy. Uh, about uh, the National Judicial Academy, uh, uh, I don't have much uh, uh, information except that occasionally I used to go there, but uh, never ever I heard about this topic, uh, I heard about other things. So I'm not sure that uh, even there it is uh, discussed uh, more particularly at the National Judicial Academy. They will discuss more uh, issues of higher relationship in the courts and what kinds of decisions high courts are supposed to give and uh, the Supreme Court and all that, but uh, not these issues. Uh, therefore, please excuse me. So if uh, I am unable to tell you anything special about it, the only thing is that uh, I find that uh, with, uh, uh, of course, it is very slow process, but the process is there that slowly even the most conservative country like Ireland, uh, they have also through uh, referendum amended their constitution and now have allowed uh, uh, this uh, right of uh, women. Uh, in Germany, of course, uh, uh, they say that uh, <coughs> human dignity, which is uh, one of the most important rights there, that uh, uh, doesn't allow termination of uh, pregnancy, except in very rare cases where there is danger to the life of the woman. So, accepting in those cases. So, uh, it's not that uh, Germany is a very conservative country, but uh, maybe that contrary to the reason for MTP in India, where uh, uh, because of increasing population, we wanted to reduce uh, or control the population. In Germany, they want to increase the population, so that may also be one of the uh, considerations in the mind of the judges, but that has been the case. In uh, America, Supreme Court has been quite uh, uh, actually liberal and supportive of the right of women, but uh, the governments, particularly in the states, actually, they keep on uh, making laws which discourage, discourage uh, uh, the exercise of women's uh, rights, uh, but at the same time, a struggle goes on. There are governments which support us, and there are courts which support that right, and I hope slowly that irrespective of the bad experiences uh, which uh, uh, all of you must have had uh, until now, uh, uh, they will slowly uh, be changed. I, I, I remember that uh, only a few weeks back, I, I come from a village and keep going there, um, that uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, bohus in the family, <laughs> uh, she decided not to have more than two children, and uh, so uh, she has two children, and then perhaps uh, the latest pregnancy she got aborted. And the mother-in-law was very angry that uh, uh, she is now deciding independently of, without asking us and all that. So those kinds of oppositions are there, but even in the villages people have now uh, uh, changing, uh, changed and uh, they are now also exercising this right. Hopefully in course of time uh, the society will change and the kind of questions you face now, maybe your successors will not face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepika, for uh, giving me the opportunity to learn something, though I was only part of the session here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, so now I'll introduce Professor uh, Asha Bajpai, who's been introduced, um, yes, earlier, right? Am I? Am I? No, I think I've been at so many events with you. <laughs> so Dr. Bajpai is a PhD in law with specialization on child rights. Her PhD thesis was on the best interests of the child in the Indian legal system. She's been involved in teaching, training, research, and legislative reform for more than three decades. She is the founder dean of the School of Law, Rights, and Constitutional Governance at TISS. 
Dr. Bajpai is recognized as a national and international expert on child rights and laws and is associated with several national and international associations and networks. She is a hold, the holder of the India Chair of the UNCRC Policy Center. She is a member of the Child Watch International Research Board and the Global Alliance for Justice Education. Thank you, Payal. Thank you, um, Deepika and Upasana, and for inviting me here today. And uh, the, what I have to speak today is on the role of academic institutions in taking this forward. All the stories, all the success stories that we spoke about, all the judgments that we spoke about since morning. How, how, what role can academic institutions play in this? I would like to share with you, I have designed a course on access to justice for the vulnerable and marginalized at, the, at TISS. It's a one-year LLM course. And in that, I brought in all the rights issues of marginalized and vulnerable groups, including the reproductive rights as one of the things. And one of the, one of the uh, components of this course was a compulsory legal aid clinic where students have to go into the field, all of them, and a credited one. It was a credited one. Now, when I did this, I, the objective was that they learn the realities in the field of the vulnerable groups, and they apply the law to the field. That was the objective of this. But since it was credited, somehow the impression that students have of a legal aid clinic is voluntary. It is voluntary work. It can't be compulsory. I, I made it compulsory and I gave credits to it. It was almost six credits for this work. I faced a lot of opposition. I faced a lot of opposition from the students on this because many of them had come from what we call law schools where it was not a compulsory course, where it was not a credited course, including the faculty who did not want this to be credited and the students as well. This experience I want to share with you because when you're talking about role of higher educations, role of higher institutions, we need to understand that there are certain norms and practices there also, certain approaches there also, where we need to break them before we go ahead. So the first thing that we need to do is that when we are planning a curriculum, we plan a curriculum in such a way that these attitudes, these approaches, these tendencies, we try to break. I had, I had to take back that thing about compulsory. It's not compulsory anymore. It's not credited anymore. It is field work in a different manner. So we call it field work. Now we don't call it legal aid clinic. A field work through legal aid clinic. So that's the change, change I had to make. Secondly, when we had interviews for this LLM course, we had LLB graduates coming from various law schools. When you ask them, do you know what is right to education? What is Article 21 at the inter 21A at the interview? There are some students who can under you can answer this, and you know from where they come. I don't want to say, but majority of the students are not aware of social legislations because that has not been included in their curriculum, and they are not aware of that. So it is it is very difficult for us at that stage at the LLM stage. What we have to do is. Start with the social laws, social legislations right from scratch, for because the majority of them are not aware of it. There is only a few groups, which we I don't want to name them, who they are, from which background, who are aware of social laws, who have a social law background. But the majority of them are not. So when we are talking about higher education, we need to see to it that the curriculum itself at the first stage, we need to understand. And this approach of the students of credited, non-credited social laws, access to justice, we need to break that first. That is one thing. And we need to have a strategy. We need to have a an effective strategy how to mainstream these kinds of issues into, into legal education. I remember we had done at the National Judicial Academy a one-day session with the Center for Reproductive Rights a few years back. An entire day we got for reproductive rights. Melissa was there, and we, pr we produced a resource book on that. It's high time. Now we do it again with so many judgments coming up. It's time we do such a thing again over there uh, at the Judicial Academy and all state academies 
ways, we should see to it that, and I think I've heard that you have already done a lot of work on having a resource book, what we call a case book. We had thought of case book on contracts. Remember, starting uh, when we were students, case book on contracts, case book. But now we have a case book on reproductive rights. I think that can be used as a very good resource material when we are talking about training in the judicial academies or even training in the law schools that is there. A, a small seminar course on reproductive rights could be included as a course at the LLM level, at the LLB level, at both levels it can be included. We could also have what is called, um, when uh, we have a legal aid clinic, in the legal aid clinic we have lawyers who are coming. And one of the lawyers, family court lawyers, she was practicing for several years. When a matter came to her, asking her that um, I'm facing domestic violence at home and uh, what, do, what do I do? Her response was that she was not sure whether the domestic violence law applies to uh, Muslim women. She was not sure. So what I'm trying to say, and she has been practicing for so many years, what I'm trying to say is that we need to see to it that social laws, social legislations get a very important role, very, very important role in college, in curriculums of the law schools, and also not something like youth is come optional. It's not optional, it is compulsory, and it's, it's, everybody needs to have a foundation of that. Now, this reproductive rights could be included in the LLM course. In the, We have a very a foundation course in the LLM called public law. Now, in this public law, this could easily come as a, as a very important component over there. Uh, case methods, yes, everybody knows we could, uh, your resource book will be an important resource material for the case methods that is there. We, so uh, capacity building is also very important. We have spoken about it throughout the day. Medical fraternity as a, is an important thing. We can't call it um, uh, training. We can't call it orientation. We need to have coin a different word, word for them so that they come in and see to it that how they write reports, how they write um, uh, the reports when they do uh, investigation for a rape matter or any sexual assault matter, what kind of vague reports do they write? Do they, do, are they aware of the protocols that are there? Even today, even last two, three years back when we had small children being produced in the court with, and the report, medical reports were written, habituated to sexual intercourse. That is normally written in the thing. So doctors also need to be looked, at, trained and seen to it that they are sensitive to such issues that are there. The other thing that I wanted to say was that um, the, law, law, the law reform part of it, yes, there was a mention about state rules. Yeah, I know. state I thought it was not for me. <laughs> I, I looked at it. The state rules are easier to amend than the actual law. So we could begin somehow if, if there is an opportunity to look at state rules. Many of us are involved in drafting state rules. I have been involved in drafting many state rules. I think we could use that opportunity as academicians. Many of us could use that opportunity to see to it that we draft sensitive and also bring in such issues that we are here in the state rules rules that are there. The final thing that I, since the time is up, the final thing that I would like to say is that we would look at the, perhaps, the implementation part of it. In the implementation part of it, awareness is very important. I don't want to go into details, but one small example that I would like to do, we are doing legal awareness, legal literacy in the M ward. M East Ward in Mumbai. Now, M East Ward is the ward with the lowest human development indexes. The, it has the highest maternal mortality rates over there, the, and no schools. It's a, it's a very uh, slum kind of an area. There we realize that these rights are very important, uh, being violated blatantly day in and day out. I think those areas we need to look at and bring in legal awareness and see to it that implementation is done there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and comprehensive. Thank you. Um, so our final speaker is Professor Ajay Pandey, who is an associate professor and executive director of clinical programs at Jindal Global Law School. Um, he was a Fulbright scholar at the Vanderbilt University Law School, um, and he also obtained his master's of law in clinical education there. He is a recipient of a Legal Education Innovation Award of the Society of Indian Law Firms and the Menon, uh, Institute of Legal Advocacy Training in the year 2012 for his experiment with clinical legal education and his community empowerment work. 
His areas of interest include clinical legal education, human rights, consumer rights, international law, constitutional law, legal aid to the poor, legal literacy, community empowerment and transparency, accountability, and good governance. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Payal. Um, I'll very directly come to the work that I do. I think uh, uh, some of us can really uh, find a way out uh, when it comes to the way forward uh, from from the work that I I uh, I do, and I say it because I I do this work with a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, unrest actually, and the unrest is that when as a teacher of law and as an associate um, of law with uh, more than 20 years now, um, uh, those when we actually started this initiative that I, I'll be talking to you about, uh, uh, we thought that uh, there was a disconnect between what law promises to people and what actually happens at the grassroots. But as we went along uh, doing the work at the grassroots, we figured it out that, and I use very strong terms here actually, it's just not disconnect, it's a conspiracy, right? So I say, uh, and I tell my students, and I tell everyone, uh, actually, I, I work uh, very intensively with communities uh, these days. I've taken leave from the university, and I'm full-time with the communities in Haryana. Uh, we work with rural communities. Uh, and uh, I say that this, this conspiracy, law, its language, its mechanisms, its structures, and their language, they together weave a conspiracy against the common people, right? And this is something which I had actually read uh, long back, uh, George Bernard Shaw uh, uh, writing that every profession is a, is a conspiracy against the laity. Uh, and this is what I actually discovered, and I think uh, working with communities is the way forward, I very strongly feel. And I often realize that when we talk of law, uh, we forget litigants, actually. And I remember uh, the Bar Council of India um, celebrating its uh, Golden Jubilee year and inviting uh, a lot of people. There were thousands of people invited to Vigyan Bhavan. I was also one of, one of them. Uh, there were academics, there were lawyers, there were judges, and there were no litigants actually, right? And I mean, how soon we forget uh, the very, the very first, uh, I can say, the very first provision of the Constitution of India. That's the we, the people of India, right? So. Uh, I, I don't know whether I, I can call it uh, the very first provision, but I, 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 I say it to my students that look at that provision, what happens to it later on. So it begins with we the people of India. And that's the story with every law. And uh, uh, the, the, the experience with the clinic is also the same that when we approach uh, these institutions which are supposed to uh, secure effective implementation of law, we figure out that there's uh, there's a huge failure. Um, we, we started this, uh, this work uh, with communities from six villages in Haryana, uh, this Mewad district in 2008, uh, with nine women participating in the group, 35 people in the group. Uh, this has grown big. Now we work in more than 400 villages in Haryana alone, and we have uh, 5,000 people who participate uh, in this program this year. They are participating in this program. They are all villagers, rural people. They don't know uh, uh, law. They don't understand. They, 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 are, they, they may not even be literate. The idea is to include these people in processes of law, in, in having them also appreciate law. Uh, so uh, they, and we organize uh, about 350 training sessions every month in Mewat alone, so it's a big number actually. Uh, the, the, the initiative has reached uh, Bihar, it has reached Rajasthan, and we involve law students, uh, law faculty in this experiment, and this is all about uh, making effective implementation of law as a matter of uh, kind of movement, 
uh, maybe a silent one, a nationwide movement involving people and communities. So I'll stop here, and if there are any questions, I'll take those questions. Thank you. Thank you all. This was a really actually inspiring panel to me, at least, to think about ways to partner and, and move forward. Um, I counted 10 different general categories of ideas over the course of today, um, including um, with law schools, training students on um, social laws and ensuring they have that education, that they're also educated on reproductive rights and also the obligation to address stereotypes and to challenge those stereotypes, um, and even to understand what stereotypes are even present in the law and the role they play um, in leading to violations of women's rights. Um, a case book on reproductive rights, uh, and also potentially a, a legal aid clinic. As, as I was listening to everybody, I was thinking a reproductive rights legal aid clinic, how interesting would that be? Um, and I think that's in the vein of the call to action that Colin gave us this morning of sending out hundreds of law students around the country to you know, start addressing these rights, at least you know, connecting people to, service, to legal services uh, on this issue. There was also really great suggestions about national and state judicial academies, um, specifically focusing on reproductive rights, but also on human rights, that I think several people presented today that a lot of the cases that are positive on reproductive rights include a strong human rights component. And, but judges are not trained in human rights until perhaps they do the training when they take on a new position, this is what we heard earlier. But even maybe some don't get that, potentially even at other levels, like the district or sessions court level. So I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, and I think, P Professor Singh, I may come back to you to ask how we can engage and sort of you know, bring that training back into the curriculum the way that you know, we were able to do it earlier, um, short of potentially a high court case requiring an order, like with the PCP NDT Act. Uh, we also heard from Stella Paul about the need for media spaces in our events. Um, and I wonder maybe if that means that they don't have to be formal press events. but just a place to share information and build capacity. Um, celebrating good judgments, and I'm really open to suggestions on what that means. How do, we, how do we have these cases be viewed at the way and the reverence that a case like Vishaka is understood when it is just so critical for equality, um, just the way that that, is, uh, that case was. Um, follow-up lawyering, so lawyers were not exempt from the follow-up here. It sounds like you know the continuing to go to the court to get what we want. Um, and also to think about uh, the need for state follow-up at the state level for rules, the formation of rules, um, implementing rules at the state level as well. Uh, and also replicating what's happening in one state and another state, I think, is, is something we really should be thinking about when there's a success. Um, and thinking of how to contextualize it to that context, but also to learn from those experiences. There was also a lot on movement follow-up and the need for strong civil society, for legal strategies that are rooted in the the issues identified by communities themselves and by movements, local movements themselves, um, and also the role of these movements in monitoring implementation and feeding information. Um, and then there was also a broader thought about combating the judicialization, which I hadn't heard, but I, I actually really love that phrase, um, that, that leads people to think that they have to go to the court each and every time. And, and maybe it is that we need to file a follow-up order in one of these cases um, where the judiciary has has come forward and said and asked them now clarify that we don't need to keep coming back here um, because as we know doctors are if they see one case or girls even if they see one case that has to go to the court that maybe they think oh that means I have to go to the court too instead of thinking as often lawyers do that's settled law now and we can move on um, and I think building girls awareness specifically and the legal awareness of communities was another really strong and important suggestion um, and potentially something that can be linked to law schools as well. So these are just what I saw, but I don't know if others have thoughts that have come to mind. I think we have about 10 minutes, um, and then we can continue chatting over tea. Yes. about the need for judgments. And also we had another speaker who was um, speaking a little bit of uh, on out-of-pocket expenditure and the cost in the legal system, in the health system and all. And when I was associated with HLN, actually we were very closely looking at the, um, at the health budget. And I think with uh, all this, like peer intelligence, 
available here, it would be a good thing to do something similar to the right to food campaign because ultimately um, if we want to make uh, women's rights and reproductive rights a reality, we also have to increase the spending because the court orders are fine. But uh, I went, for example, to, um, to Keonja district in Orissa. I went to Nagaland. And then you see, okay, this is supposed to be an Anganwadi center. Here, this is supposed to be a sub-center, a community health center, a PHC. And then you realize that the order is fine, but unless the infrastructure is also not there, um, this is all just meaningless talk. And uh, that way I can uh, understand the frustration of, uh, of Colin. And so what we had done is, um, or were trying to do, basically, and it was a very turbulent phase in my life, so I couldn't achieve that work, unfortunately. Um, but what we were trying to do is that we said, okay, we have all these fact findings. We have fact findings on maternal mortality. We have fact findings on uh, medical negligence, on this, that various aspect from all the states. And, we, and so what we kind of were thinking that is, all the fact findings which are already there of different, on different issues for women rights can basically be used also to demand something similar to the treatment and action campaign in South Africa, where basically through litigation they have kind of forced the state to increase the health budget. So I know it's not the competence of the court to, to ask for a budget increase, but the court can make a decision which will have incidental consequences for the budget. And so what I was thinking is just that we uh, look at all these fact findings, uh, look at all the issues we have identified and where we have information on it al already, and then maybe we push for something like um, enforceability of the Indian public health standards, which are really at the moment not worth the paper they are written on. So just as a... Thank you, thank you. Um, and Deepika? Thank you so much for this great panel. Uh, I'm going to take from Colin's comment in the morning, which is something that I've taken with me in the last 13 years since I worked with Colin. I started my career with Colin, and it's always been the problem. There are just not enough lawyers to go to the court. Even as colleagues, we had 10 cases, and we could only do seven. And even after that, some of us could not sustain in that uh, uh, setup because of the, uh, I mean, not don't get well paid. There's funding issues. There are so many other issues. The state is not helpful when it comes to legal aid. You don't know where to go. You're looking for legal aid cases. You, you, litigants don't know how to get to you because they don't even have the money to travel in the bus. So sometimes you're paying that money for the litigants, right? So that, the, those, are the, those are the issues that Colin sort of spoke about. That ties into what uh, Dr. Bachpai spoke about, which is that how do law schools provide for those solutions? Because I think some of the solutions are with the law schools, right? So how do you do that? And what you did was amazing and inspiring, which is that you have three, six credits, which is a lot of credits for student as mandatory clinic. Now, as I'm the associate dean at General, and I design curriculum, and we've tried to uh, brainstorm a lot as to what we can do for the society in terms of changing the legal paradigm in the last 30 years, where legal education is heavily regulated by the Bar Council, where human rights is not a mandatory subject. Human rights, which is a mandatory subject everywhere else, everywhere else in the world, is not in India. Right? So what do you do with that? And when you try to introduce that, there's huge resistance, like you, like you said, there's resistance from students. But students are also victims of a certain prestige and perception, which is that law is now very prestigious because it is like MBA. It can get you the law firm salaries that you could not when we were doing law. And our parents weren't happy about we would, when we did law. So I think that is something that has changed because students are clearly very happy. There are some students who are sitting here. So in general, what we've done, and we face opposition all the time. We've just introduced critical legal theory which we think is so fundamental. And we've spent last two weeks just justifying to students why we're doing this. Right? So students will always have that uh, problem. But I think what I've noticed in the last nine years at Jindal, that students, we have five years to mold them. Five years to sort of, and there are students with trouble hearts. There are students who want these outlets to do things. And but we should, so what, what I was trying to ask Dr. Vajpayee was, why did you revoke it? Because uh, that, is not, that is not encouraging. I think there, are, there should be examples of legal aid clinics running throughout the country. And you know that very few people like Ajayji are doing that. So how do we sort of come together to make, so I've been persuading uh, Payal also to do a clinic on reproductive rights because I know that we've just started doing many multiple clinics in Jindal. And we don't have many students. We don't have many takers. We take 10 students every year. One full year, we train them 
in, in one subject and we write a report together. They're all co-authors, stakeholders in the subject. But it's only 10 students that we can get and we can train. But it's still a beginning because those students, those 2009 graduates from Jindal are now doing social litigation. They've taken that as, as an option and that makes us ex extremely happy and it's very encouraging. So I think education can change a lot of things. And I think we should as stakeholders come together to do something about it. How can we introduce, like how can Malvika come to our classrooms and be so inspiring? Because I think students are looking for such inspirations. I can tell you from my experience of teaching nine years, they, they're looking for these inspirations. Thank you. Can I respond? Uh, yes, Deepika, it's a good question. Even it was heartbreaking for me to revoke it because a lot of passion had gone into that course. The problem was this is a one-year LLM. I don't have students for at least, if I have at least for two years, it, I could have made a difference. But one year, and in that one year, they are, they are almost, you know, it's like a crash course, one-year LLM. So in that one year, it was not easy. It was difficult. By the time you finish the semesters and you finish the field work, they are, they are ready to go. Their dissertation is there, it's coming. So one year made a difference. Perhaps if the LLM course is extended to two years, perhaps we could try it again. That is one thing. The second thing I want to talk about community clinic. Maybe a community clinic, uh, as you suggested, Deepika, maybe a community clinic on reproductive rights. It'll make a lot of difference. Taking various communities and doing it over there. Uh, I also have to share something with you, Deepika. Uh, we are going to actually organize four regional workshops on promoting uh, clinical legal education in India. And the first one will be in Goa next month. And then we go in some other parts of uh, India. So that's happening. And uh, we have really not thought of reproductive rights, but now we can all join and uh, do it also in, in, in include that uh, in it. Yeah. When you do that, I would love to know where and when you are doing that. <laughs> Thank you. There are people leave in the middle. So people who they're working with get discouraged because they don't really feel that something is happening. And at that point of time, so there's, there's this struggle between compulsory course and being an optional thing because people who have passion for it come in, and but, the, but then those people also might leave in the end. So it's kind of a struggle, but it, I mean, it, I think it, it would take a lot of time to actually mold people into that because if you actually want to help people, you can't just leave after one year and be like, okay, I've done my part. So one year, it's a one year LLM course. That's the problem. It's not. No, this, this yeah. happens even in a five-year course in our college. It's, it's not a new thing. <laughs> ask um, Professor Singh as well the question following up so how do we engage with the judiciary like how do we have reproductive rights be something that you know like like the one-day session that Dr. Bajpai had mentioned how do we um, do that uh, yeah this can be followed up because now uh, uh, the High Court requires it they have given direction to the, the Delhi Judicial Academy at least and uh, Though, of course, I am not associated now with the academy for the last four years three, or more than three years, uh, uh, yet I can uh, actually exert some influence in the sense that the judicial academy is all, also in the campus of the, uh, this uh, NLU Delhi, and uh, I am staying there. <coughs> and uh, interestingly, means the current uh, chairperson is my former student, so I, <laughs> that way also I can <laughs> impact them. <laughs> I can impact them. So we will try that. Uh, and uh, I'll mention that not only that act, but this other act, MTP also. And reproductive rights itself uh, should be discussed with the uh, judges, and they must be made conscious that the people need not go to the Supreme Court for these uh, things. They they should be settled at the district level itself. Maybe Thank I'll you. add on something Please, to yes, this. Yes. Uh, see, every high court has a judge, maybe the second senior most judge, who's in charge of the judicial academies. So maybe, the, maybe we could approach them 
in the various states and talk to them that when they are making the training calendars for the next year, perhaps they include it. So that's the right time when you could do it and approach the judge in charge of the judicial academies. Perhaps that will help. Perhaps. And in uh, Delhi yeah. at the moment there is a lady, judge, okay. uh, who is in charge. So she can easily be Justice Kohli. So she can be approached for this purpose for giving direction to judicial academy. <coughs> Okay, well, thank you all. I know we're at time, and I, I feel I already gave the wrap up in the sense of going through all the suggestions, so I'm gonna not mince words, but thank you all. I think there's a vote of thanks, and then we can break for tea. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, Swati Malik, on behalf of Center for Health, Law, Ethics, and Technology, would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor C. Rajkumar, Ms. Payal Shah, and uh, Ms. Sonali Rejmi from Center for Reproductive Rights, to all the participants and the moderators for engaging and participating on, in this symposium on, set, on reproductive rights in Indian courts. I would also like to thank various departments of Jindal Global University, without which it would not have been possible to organize this unit this event, especially Ms. Deepa, Mr. Rahul, Mr. Mr. Vikas Chandok, uh, Mr. Devdeep, and the entire events management team. And I'll also like to acknowledge the efforts and contribution of my colleague Justin. Without him, it was not possible to pull this event together. So I hope we continue to engage on in all these conversations in the future as well. Thank you very much.